Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Wilder podcast. In this episode, we focus on the Grange project and our journey as we discuss the approach we're now taking, physical changes on the land, talk about the business side of the project and the education and future plans for what we're trying to achieve. Chloe, hello. Hello, Tom. I'm sorry, dear listener, that it's going to be just Chloe and I's voice you're going to listen to today. And it's designed to be a recap of the journey so far. So if you are new to the podcast, I think this is going to be a great episode. But also, if you're a loyal listener and you've been here since the start, I think there's going to be a load of bits of detail that we probably don't go into on our normal episodes. And it hopefully will consolidate everything that's happening on the project in one beautiful little episode. And actually, the last time we did this was episode nine. And we kind of intended to do this a little bit more regular than we have done. But, you know, here we go. I think it's just because there are so many interesting people to talk to that it's hard to justify the whole time of an episode for the Grange Project itself. But I think we're really at a transitional point in the journey. And it's a really useful time to stop, reflect on where we've come from, where we're going to. And then we've got the winter to make it all happen. And also being human beings, we're also slightly avoidant. And these episodes are, we don't like listening to our own, own voice. And so they are probably the most uncomfortable episodes that we do, despite, I think, having some value. Anyway, that's enough of that. And should we talk through on the top level each thing we're going to cover and then go into more detail? Let's do that. So we're going to start off by talking about the rewilding approach. So what are some of the ideas that inform how we do the rewilding? Who do we work with? And what are some of the physical changes that have happened on the project as a result of this approach? And how does it feel different a year on? specifically how it's evolved. We've started our journey, you know, back to episode nine and listened to what we aspire to achieve. A lot of it we've achieved, other areas we've evolved and pivoted based on learning more about what we're doing. So that we're going to cover that, that we're going to move into. Once we've done the theory and the approach, we've gone the physical changes, what we've actually done on this project here. And that's quite cool and really quite exciting. And that's a balance between volunteer work and then some of the works we're doing with grants, which Chloe will go into more detail. And then we're going to move from that onto planning. Regular listeners will know there's been a bit of a planning journey, but we got there. What does that actually mean? So now we have this permission. How are we going to use that to help develop the business side of the project? So then that will take us into the business conversation and where we hope to generate revenue. When we talk about startups and new businesses, there's a little well-known graph where there's a big dip at the start where a lot of investments going in and not a lot of revenue is being generated. And we are quite literally at the bottom of that graph. We are heavily investing and it's a quite a challenging period. I think we're going to talk about that. But excitingly, where we see the opportunities for us to generate revenue. And ultimately, what does this revenue mean? Because we are part of a community interest company. The profit is all going to go towards some fantastic education. And we'll talk a bit about why we think that's really important. And finally, we're going to finish off with future plans, what we think we're going to achieve over the next six months or so, and why we think they're important. And you can all hold us to account as the listeners, because we're, we're telling them publicly, which means we have to do them. We have to try to do them, unless there's good evidence to suggest we shouldn't. And that's all about being fluid and dynamic. Flexible. <laughs> So as we discussed in episode nine, we had a bit of a quandary around our approach to rewilding and we started off thinking about the role of professional advice and what we discovered in that process is that professional advice is varied and there were lots of different ideas around what that could look like. We had ecologists come out and say everything from we need to plough up 40% of the project and reseed through to let's just let nature do its thing and just watch and wait. In the end, we decided that we were going to use our judgment and the knowledge that we gained along the way through speaking to some fantastic guests and reading and learning through various other resources to get to the point where we wanted to feel clear about what we were doing and why. And we wanted to bring people along with us, which leads us to this theory of rewilding here, which is for us about collaboration working with people it's about bringing people to the site to help us do the rewilding and it's about engaging people on that journey yeah and it's about failure which a lot of people talk about we want to try things out and fail and learn from it as opposed to someone tell us the right way to do it and a great example of that just anecdotally is the tree planting in the bracken area we were told that often where bracken is that's where a wood is trying to exist so we thought well let's you know put the saplings in there without any guards to protect them because we thought well the bracken will protect the saplings from the grazing herbivores deer basically and then the saplings will then erupt from these uh, this bracken and create it's beautiful wooded area now we know we we haven't yet seen the impact of that but the thickness of the bracken and the aggressiveness of the bracken would definitely suggest that that was a bad idea and we would learn from that therefore next year we'll think about maybe putting better guards around it or protecting them in some way maybe a professional ecologist would have suggested at the start this wasn't a good plan but this is the point of us learning so we can share those learnings with everybody and make the information as accessible as possible and i wonder if it's worth saying just how we divide the project up 
Yeah, before you do that, maybe just give an overview of our project size, because again, someone might be new and may, may not understand the size of the project we're working on and the type of topography. So we've got 80 acres and it's a bowl shape, which is creates a lot of possibilities because it makes it feel perhaps bigger than it actually is. Running through the centre of the project is a stream. It's majority what we describe as semi-improved grassland, basically a field that has been used for silage crop over many years. And there are some areas of lovely hedgerow and there's some little areas of woodland and there's some little pockets of marshy grassland. But on the whole, what you're looking at is permanent pasture. That's an awesome ancient oak trees spotted across the land. Absolutely. Going back to this idea of how we divided it up, so we're really lucky to be working with lots of different people to help with our rewilding, and that's a really important part for us as a community rewilding project. So the first group we're working with, who've got 30 acres of the project to manage, are Young Wilders, who are a youth non-profit outreach organisation that are trying to get young people aged 18 to 30 involved in rewilding. So we have two fantastic wild stewards who are helping us design the interventions. They've done a lot of our surveying. They've helped us understand what we currently have and, and how we can make the most out of the habitat we've got here. And what's great about Young Wilders is it's specifically designed to give younger people opportunities to actually be lead on rewilding or interventions. It's wonderful about supporting their expertise and knowledge, but crucially their CVs, so that they can take the next step into conservation or rewilding with true experience that maybe you wouldn't get until a little bit older. So that's really exciting. The next section of the project is set aside for our amazing great project community. So we have these in community days where we have people come together and there are various different activities going on depending on what you're interested in or what you fancy getting stuck into. These days have already had a really transformative effect on some of the land that's managed by our community. From our perspective, you are not part of the community until you come for that first day and you are now forever and will be a member of the Grange Project community and along for our journey. So yeah, I definitely recommend anybody looking to dip their toe in the water to consider coming along for those kind of days. But on that note, we have our third community day coming up, which is on the 19th of October, so really not far away. We're going to talk about the physical changes later on and grants, but it's basically to help us plant a tiny forest, which is a cool Miriwaki Japanese method of planting a forest that grows super quickly and super healthily. Very exciting, requires no expertise or knowledge, so definitely think about that and the link will be in the show notes. Next section is set aside for us as a family. So we have a little bit of land which we are experimenting with and we've done various different slightly outside the box things in that space that we'll talk more about later. And the final section, we're really excited to be working with some of the schools in our local area and we've set aside a lovely 20 acre field for them to come and use as their rewilding playground. And what's cool about that is that some of the younger children in classes are going to get involved let's say in the tiny forest as well and they're going to get to see during their time at primary school in this example it grow to you know two three times the height of, of them just during that time period so they can see a very real tangible value to the work that they put in and see the difference as it goes along and we'll talk a bit more about the education being at the heart of this project towards the end of the podcast but before we get into the detail of some of the physical changes that have occurred on the land here, I wonder whether it's worth just briefly talking about the importance of baselining, which was a term that was new to me and to both of us even a year ago. So baselining is just this idea that you make a sense and understand of what you currently have on your land. And the reason behind doing that is to ensure that through your rewilding interventions that you don't inadvertently destroy the most beautiful area of habitat or the most nature-rich space that you have available to you. Yeah, and it's also there about for telling the story, about understanding actually also not just the negative impact you might have, but also the positive impacts you have, what worked, what hasn't worked, etc. But it's not as simple as that, is it? It's not. You think, oh, we'll just survey some stuff. And it turns out that surveying even a very small thing like invertebrate is super expensive because you need very highly trained ecologists to come. So then you think, OK, well, how else are we going to get around this? And we've been working with some fantastic volunteer groups over the summer. So we've had... Monmouthshire Botany Group, Gwent Ornithological Society, the South East Wales Biodiversity Record Centre. Um, and they've come and they've done some fantastic surveying for us. And, you know, it's not at the level of rigour that you might need for a evidence-based report, but it helps us to tell the story, which is what we think is really critical. But the main official baseline we've done is our habitat survey, which has also included some soil testing, which helps us to really pinpoint what we currently have in terms of habitat and hopefully show a demonstration and a shift in that over the next five, ten years. Yeah, and this has been quite frustrating, I think, specifically for me, that this area really isn't codified. There's no set standard methodology that every land that wants to do rewilding should do. There are organisations trying now to kind of retrospectively work out how to do it. 
but it is so frustrating when you're new to a sector. We're not ecologists. We don't know what different types of baselining surveying methods exist. But you want to evidence the value you're doing. You speak to three different people, get three different answers, ranging from don't worry, just do a habitat survey. That's fairly inexpensive, relatively speaking. Or no, no, you've got to do it properly. And oh, by the way, you know, we're getting into the tens of thousands, if not low hundred, if it's larger site thousands of pounds just to baseline this so it's been a pretty uncomfortable process we think we've got to a you know a really good position now and going forward we will be able to evidence the story hopefully of the positive impact we're having on the land which is really ultimately what we're trying to do here so that kind of wraps up nicely our approach and a bit of an update there i'm keen now to move on to the physical changes on the project Are you happy absolutely but before we do that, a special shout out to some of the volunteers that came onto the project. They've been amazing and, and involved in a lot of these physical changes. We've got Ranger Jerry, who's also been a guest on the podcast. We've got Shona, who came and stayed for six weeks. And as I'm looking out the window, I'm seeing a kestrel fly up and down past our barns. That's pretty cool. Um, so Shona came and she stayed on the project for six weeks and she brought a myriad of friends with her who came and stayed for various between one to two weeks and just got stuck in. And because of that, we are in a much better place, not only with the physical interventions, but also tracking the wildlife on the land, tracking the growth and health of the saplings we've planted. It's just been brilliant. And we honestly would be so much further back in what we're doing without them. And not only that, just nice people to spend time with. Yeah, absolutely. And and to Lloyd and Ollie as well, who've been really helpful in thinking about our citizen science surveys and doing various different activities to help ensure we're going to be able to offer some amazing activities for people when they come onto the site. Right. Physical changes. We've done lots. Now, we are an 80 acre site and a lot of people say 80 acres is, is not a lot of space for a rewilding project. And speaking to people like Professor Ali Driver from Rewild in Britain, it's almost like the smaller a site is, the kind of more interventions you're going to have to do to try and mimic some of the activities that nature would have done naturally on, on these bigger sites. So we've done quite a lot of, I think, positive stuff and really satisfying. And we'll start us off, probably the most satisfying element is defencing. I mean, crudely, it's like squeezing a spot. It's, oh, oh it is. It, it's, it's like, it's pulling these uh, man-made structures in straight lines off and knowing that as you're doing it, it's quick, it's fairly easy to do it, and it's allowing that free movement of wildlife across the project. And I think what's also important to say about that is how it changes the feel of the place. Mm. Because when you're wandering through the fields now, you don't have that in-your-face man-made structure of the fence with its intention around enclosure, which is obviously an important intention for a lot of farmers, but it helps us to create a feel of a wilder landscape. On that note, if there are any artists or sculptors around, we have an ungodly amount of rotten fence posts and sheep netting. So if anyone wants to come and create some sort of amazing sculpture using as much of that material as possible, you know where we are. Email us at hello at greensproject.co.uk. What should we do next? Let's talk about the trees. So in our first community day back in March now, we did some tree planting. And again, there's a debate, isn't there, in rewilding? Do you let trees just naturally regenerate or do you tree plant? And I think alluding to what Tom said earlier about the size of the site and also about the engagement potential of people coming and planting a tree and how that's also a really important part for us around bringing people along with the nature recovery. And the biodiversity emergency all of those contexts if it's important for us to do some tree planting with native trees and back to Shona did an amazing job of documenting all those trees and checking on their health in the summer and we're delighted to say that about 95% are still doing their thing and growing healthily. 90 to 95% and it's just amazing the things you learn. We put in the saplings with varying different kinds of tree guards but with a, with a post to obviously keep them erect. And what we didn't appreciate is that those fence posts become this amazing perch for birds. Birds then poop and they're pooping onto our saplings quite considerably and affecting their growth and their health because we didn't cut off or hammer in the post low enough. It's just these things that you learn that you wouldn't think about normally. But without that surveying that, Sh that Shona had done, we wouldn't have realised that. And you'll also, when you come for a walk around the project, see some of our brash piles, which are attempts at creating nature's protection for the trees, essentially piles of dead wood and bramble, which help will protect some of the little saplings that are growing there, not in tubes. And we're hopefully we're going to create a lot more of those across the project over this week. They've been really satisfying because it just feels very natural to do. And it's all part of our defielding efforts. Before we started, even though we took up the fence lines, they still look like big open fields. So being able to bring these brush piles into the centre of these fields breaks it up really well, clearly makes valuable protective areas for small mammals, nice perches for birds. And we've planted those saplings in there without tree guards. And you can tell those are the ones that are thriving the most if, you, if, if and when you walk around. So very, very cool. 
on the theme of trees, this isn't an intervention we've necessarily done, but something we've allowed to remain, which is two of the older oaks that we have in the project have both sadly over the summer come down, which... Not true. One of them has, one of them is partly, but keep going. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> That's both a problem and an opportunity. The problem is, is obviously the loss of that beautiful tree and the majesty of an aged oak in full bloom. But the opportunity of that is the habitat that's been going to be created by all this dead wood. And if we were farmers, understandably, we would have said, oh, that's a nice firewood, chopped up the oak, and that would have been our, kept us going for a few winters. But because we are nature recoverists or rewilders, maybe a better description, we're going to allow those oaks to stay where they've la- landed and see what changes that happens to that habitat as a result. Someone told me once that actually a dead oak, a large oak, it provides more habitat than a live oak, which is really cool. And that also aiding in the defuelling process. So it's all good. And it's just we're not used to seeing big trees on their side in our landscapes because we clear them away. So it is actually really quite cool. Now we've had time to get over the shock of our beautiful oaks falling down. Now having that as part of a, a talking point and, a, you know, an interesting I don't know, experiment on the project. So last winter, Tom spent many happy hours on a digger, creating some scrapes and mini ponds and places that essentially are going to hold water because we know water is really critical for biodiversity and creates its whole new ecosystem in comparison. Yeah, and you know, it goes without saying, I'm not a hydrologist and I'm also not a digger driver. So it was an interesting experiment on things I knew nothing about. But you know, lessons learned, try new things you haven't done before. Very quickly, you start to get an understanding of it. I wouldn't say an expert, but definitely an understanding. Diggers are awesome fun, just for anyone that hasn't done it before, definitely get involved. Also, turns out water flow isn't rocket science. It's just look at the land, apply common sense, dig a few holes. Essentially, last year, I really saw them as trial pits, just trial holes to see what happens and where, how does it hold and where does it hold. And all did a very good job, generally, but there was one area that just stayed wet throughout not only the winter, spring and summer, and it, and it became an amazing pig wallow. We'll go on to the pigs a little bit later on for it and also wildlife dragonflies etc so it was really satisfying to see tom an idiot in a digger who doesn't know what he's doing create a hole in the ground which has now turned into a place for wildlife and supporting our kind of wild livestock on the on the project and there's also been some opportunity because some of the spoil from those ponds have been put up into our invertebrate or beetle banks which also help with the defilding process and change the sense of the landscape a huge, yeah a huge sense if you drive down towards the house now you'll see on the right hand side probably about 20 banks and they're just starting now to kind of grass up and weeds are starting to grow we've also put some wildflower seed on them as well and apparently next year it's going to be pretty beautiful the feeling of the areas that's happened completely changes it away from being a field why are you looking really smug smugged (laughs) you're laughing on pigs aren't you what are you going to say that's what you're doing (laughs) so tom's efforts with the digger last year were often an attempt to replicate some of the effects of pigs on a landscape and now we have the third party in our relationship which is Tom's pigs which I feel only you can introduce them Tom. Oh where do I start so again just the community with the podcast is so great I and mean, one of the episodes Chloe and I were talking about maybe we should get some pigs to start doing that disturbance and someone reached out well our pig man Paul who's a GP in the local area reached out and said you know I've had pigs for a number of years let me help you be your pig mentor which, which is a wonderful term. And so he helped us get our two pigs, our two British Saddleback pigs. We haven't looked back since, have we? Tom has invested many hours in coddling these pigs with squashes. Is that, is that the term? Coddles, <laughs> which now means that we've essentially trained therapy pigs. So whenever anyone comes for a walk with a project and comes across the pigs, they're like automatic reaction. They just lie on their backs, exposing their tummies and asking for scratches. But politely, and I think that's the thing. So they, they are achieving the wild aim. They're living out and they've got complete free reign for the whole project. They are doing a significant amount of disturbance, which is great. And we're lucky we picked the two smaller of the litter because we didn't want to have too much disturbance, but they're still doing, I think we really, really effective, which is what we hope they would be. They're now part of the team, the Grange Project team. They're, they are des- described as ecosystem engineers. They're creating the a disturbance in the ground, which exposes the soil, which allows then seeds to land in there of varying types, either blown or dropped from droppings from birds. And they're creating the mounds, which again creates texture in the landscape, which creates different habitats for different kinds of invertebrates. So it's all of it is brilliant. The only detractor so far is my beautifully manicured tracks and paths that I put through the project to allow as much free access as possible for visitors is the perfect rootling area. In fact, I'll go so far as that, that was the only area that they've touched for the first 
four months of being on the project. There are these perfect lines of routling that have just followed my paths. So that's been a, a lesson learned. And then the question is whether or not we mow new paths or do we just keep mowing over the same path, rolling it down and hoping and assuming that once I've rooted it a few times, they're going to move into pastures new. Who knows? We'll find out. So you mentioned around the wildflower seeds and some of the distribution, and that's been another intervention we've done. We've sourced some local wildflower seeds from some of our lovely neighbours who have a meadow, and we've been distributing that over some of the exposed bare areas. And we also did some green hay distribution in our second community day, where essentially we take the areas of the grassland that we currently have that is most diverse, most rich in different plant life, and we distribute them again, laying them over some of the bare areas of soil. And I suppose the final intervention that we haven't really talked about, but is probably the most impactful visually, is the fact that we haven't cut the grass. Mm -hmm. So all of that grass has fallen over. It's allowed some natural regeneration. So we have areas of where we've seen some St. John's wort come through or some blackthorn appearing in the centre of fields. And it's so exciting because you're walking around the project and you never know quite what you're going to come across in terms of some of the plant diversity. Yeah, we have become those people. There's people that get, you, know, you go for walks with them and you're in the middle of a deep conversation and suddenly you go, oh, look, there's a thing and there's a thing and this is why it's really important. And I had a good friend of mine who I did that with recently who just kind of turned to me and said, Tom, that was probably the most boring conversation I've ever heard you say. So it, it is, it's a journey that everyone has to go on at their own pace. And we are very much enjoying that journey. And that thatching of that grass is great because, of course, it provides that protective layer for those small mammal population. As the small mammals, the the voles and mouse, mice, etc., grow, then our predator population grows, and it just get that circle of life starts ha- happening. And what's been striking to me, and I think you as well, Chloe, is the effect that just leaving the grass has had already on the on the wildlife on the project. Obviously, previously it would have been cut once, if not twice, by that normal time that we've just left let it grow, and therefore it would have just wouldn't given it any opportunity for feeding the house martins and the birds that swallows and swifts or whatever the cake that come down and it just completely changes the feel of the area and that's not bashing farmers because if you've got a farm you've got livestock you've got to feed them over the winter but because we're not doing that it's given us that unique opportunity to not feel the need to cut that grass and provide those extra habitats and it definitely feels different here mm-hmm. when you're walking around you have a sense of there being more wildlife there being more diversity and there's some quantitative evidence of that as well in terms of noticing just the amount of birds that we've had this summer compared to last and the number of butterflies and you know all of the impact across the whole ecosystem and before we move on kind of away from the physical changes and, and the wildlife on the project i think it's quite important to talk about some of the wildlife that we've seen the the biggest the most interesting most exciting element i think is the mating pairs of barn owls and i say pairs because we've got two separate mating pairs of, of barn owls across the land which i think is quite interesting over a sh- for a fairly small area and for those that don't know or how we know that is because their chicks have the most terrifying screech you can possibly imagine when you're walking around a project at night time and so we knew we knew that and you can hear them for hundreds of meters if not further you can hear two separate screeches from chicks and then you go to that area and you can see the the barn owls flying in and out and they seem pretty nonchalant they're now just part we're now part of the grange team together for me, also on a bird theme, it was just a few days in the summer when you were out walking the project and you were just surrounded by flocks of house martins all feeding off the seeds in the grass. And that real sense, I think, of when people talk about this idea of shifting baseline syndrome and how we know don't really appreciate the loss in nature because we didn't have the sense of what it used to be like. Those moments you really feel like, oh, th- is this what we used to have? These The yeah. kind of volume and the bioabundance of these birds. And yeah, hopefully they'll start to return here more as they work out this is a good spot to come again. Yeah. On the wildlife cameras, we call badgers, foxes, hares. We've got quite a few hair that we, we, we see around the project regularly. And coming back to the owls, we caught an owl having a bath, which is just brilliant, in the pig wallow that, that I dug. So, it, A, hilarious. And go on to the Instagram for that video under the wildlife cameras section if you want to see that. But it was brilliant. So we only just started and you can, you know, you really can feel the difference and then just can't wait for subsequent years to see how that evolves. So does that feel like that's enough on the physical changes? Yeah, and I, I know we can turn through it quickly. There's a lot to talk about. I really hope people are enjoying this. This is going to be a longer episode than previous ones, but I just hope people find it valuable as a, as a reference point. And please, if you do let us know, if you've got any advice or thoughts on how we can tweak these kind of episodes to make them more interesting or get engaging or talk about areas that you specifically wanted to focus on, feel free to send us an email at hello at grangeproject.co.uk. Or indeed, if you've got any ideas around cool rewilding interventions, always happy to trial stuff out. So just get in touch. Or if you want to just be kind, that'd be nice as well. Love a bit of that. 
we do like an email. It makes us feel better. Moving on to the next section, the changes we've done so far haven't involved huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. They haven't been super expensive to do, but we were really lucky to apply for a grant this summer that has enabled us to do something that is a bit more costly, which is our tiny forest. What is a tiny forest, Chloe? Thank you, Tom. That needed that cue. It is a area about the size of a tennis court in which you plant 600 trees. And to make sure that those trees thrive to the best of their ability, you do lots of soil testing and you excavate down a metre, which is quite a big hole when you mm. look at a tennis court sized hole of one metre. And you put soil improver back into the soil, depending on the results that came out of your testing, to ensure that the soil is at its healthiest possible place to give the trees the best chance of survival. And then because you've got these 600 trees, you're planting really quite densely. So three about every square metre. And that essentially means that they start to outcompete each other and the forest grows really quickly. It's a special Japanese method called the Miyawaki method. It's mostly used in urban contexts. So we were really pleased to get the grant here because of our focus around community and accessibility. And it will also mean that we're going to be part of the National Forest for Wales. Yeah, we get a plaque and everything. <laughs> With those trees in that tiny forest, they will generate three levels of canopy. They're specifically designed and picked based on our soil type and looking at ancient forests in the local area. And that's where they, they then output the trees that we should plant. And not only that, it's going to produce the basis of our outdoor classroom. It's designed in kind of a hollow square design, so the middle of it is missing, looking out over the beautiful valley, and it will protect the people that go and use it from the elements, as well as, because we've placed it on the top of the, one of the highest points of the project, in this big open field currently, it's going to become this amazing seed bank that hopefully will spread across the project as well. So loads of huge benefits and also we're going to be doing it as part of that community day i spoke about earlier which we'll talk about probably at the end of the podcast and i think it's worth noting here that what often gets portrayed on social media or um, other platforms is when people get are successful at grants and it kind of feels like everyone out there is getting grants left right and center and you know it's just an easy thing just submit a form and you know we were really pleased with our first application to get be successful in the grant but I think it's worth noting that we also applied for another couple of grants over the summer that we weren't successful with some were around other larger scale nature recovery interventions and some were around education and trying to really understand what do schools and young people want from a rewilding outreach education program and we weren't successful with those and it's a painful thing because you really try and tell the story and you really try and convey the benefits of what you're you're hoping to but ultimately, if you don't quite meet their shortlisting matrix, then you're not going to get through. So it's a it's a tension because we want to be able to have the maximum impact. And to do that, you need resource. But equally, it's slightly frustrating because it feels like you could do the best possible job of telling a story. But ultimately, if it doesn't quite meet what someone's looking for, you're never going to get through. So it just shows that, you know, we can't focus on grants as a source of supporting the project here. We really need to focus on the revenue generating elements of that, which we'll go on to later in the podcast. And I just want to say the amount of work you, Chloe, specifically put into these, because words are not my thing, you know, and certainly not a written word. And Chloe, that's something that you really excel at. It's really tough where you do put your heart and soul into something. Not only that, the person that gives the grants encourages you to put it in. Then says, oh, you didn't get it this time, but do it again the next time. You'll, you'll, de you'll definitely get it next time. And then, yeah, again, we get the second kind of rejection and you get really disheartened by that. And, and I think it's just, it's important for us to build our resilience, to understand the process, the game element of grants, and also just not hang our hat on these grants. Doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to apply for them, but we've got to make sure we can fund things in, in other ways and there's resilience in our processes. And it definitely gives me more respect for the process of grant application writing and fundraising because it's obviously something we've never done before. So it's new to us. And if anyone has any tips, okay, <laughs> I'd be happy to hear from them. Right. Planning update, Chloe. Go. So most of our, well, in fact, we stopped updating because it was just getting so boring around planning last winter was around our Wilder Lodge. Oh, I, I think we referred to it as an education centre at the time on the podcast. We've been we... flip-flopping around about the name, but I yeah. think we, we've landed on Wilder Lodge because it really encapsulates the multiple functions that this space is going to have. But what it currently is, is effectively a redundant agricultural barn at the centre of our project, which has an amazing outlook over the bowl. Mm -hmm. And we are going to turn that into essentially a barn conversion, a big open barn conversion that's going to be very comfortable to sit in, but also for courses, for education. There's going to be a commercial kitchen design in there for, you know, again, for anything going forward. We don't know what opportunities might present themselves. Shower block, toilets for anyone coming to stay at the project in the cabins, and also a co-working space for any businesses that we support or partner with, and a podcast recording studio there. 
to see if we want to get even more professional with what we do, maybe even do a bit of video content as well. Who knows? And what I hope it will be is the heart of the project where people come, whether you're a glamping guest, whether you're here for one of our other purposes, which we're going to talk more about, you'll be able to come. There'll be a, loads of books on rewilding. There'll be a honesty bar and honesty bakery of lots of different cakes that you can help yourself to. It'll be a space where people can come and connect and reflect on what it feels like to be part of this world of nature and part of the community. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the weather has turned recently and therefore what that means is that's the perfect time to start work and especially the grounds work on this project. So anyone knows anything about projects and specifically underpinning will understand the pain involved in that process. And we have just started that and all the holes we're digging are filling with water and there's a lot of heartache and effort going into this. But the, it has started and it will be ready for the end of Q1 next year. Let's, yeah. I think what we've learned from planning is it always takes more time than you think. And let's be optimistic and say April next year, but we'll see. And I don't know whether it's worth saying as well that with any project, as well as time, the other thing to talk about is money. And this project, as it's developed and we've found out more about what we need to meet in terms of requirements from drainage and other perspectives, it's going to cost a lot more than we thought it was going to. What that has done is put into sharp relief the importance on the more commercial less palatable conversation everyone likes to talk about protecting wildlife but actually we've got to go no no this has to be a a corporate venture that has to make money and so we we shouldn't shy away from that so since then we haven't now pivoted into looking at how we can add value and influence not only generating revenue but also continuing with our main effort of influence and influencing for the greater good and from a climate perspective and a biodiversity perspective which brings us on to one of the ways in which i think we're hoping to generate revenue on the project which is corporate partnerships to anyone here working for an organization or have friends at organizations that you might want to send this off to please do we are looking for about 10 corporate partners to come and join us on an annual basis and become part of our journey and what you get in return for becoming a partner here is not only, of course, listed on the website and everything else, but we're aware that corporates obviously have to have away days, take their staff out, reconnect, do exciting activities. And we want that to happen here. So we want to offer away days for those corporate partners. They come here, they benefit from being in nature, they benefit from getting involved in nature restoration, they benefit from the Wilder Lodge, but most importantly, they benefit from you, Chloe, and your brain. Aren't they lucky? Mm. It's worth saying that some of my professional career over the last 10 years has led me more towards being in a space of facilitating workshops and conversations with senior leadership teams. And I'm really looking forward to being able to utilise those skills in this amazing setting and with all the benefits of their outdoor spaces that we can access to really help corporates develop their culture, thinking about strategy and holding in mind the importance of employee wellbeing and the opportunities that are provided through a corporate away days. We started off by saying, of course, we could offer the presentations about biodiversity and climate, even bring in cool yoga instructors or whatever it might be. But interestingly, having spoken to a number of organizations, there's there's actually some intrinsic challenges that they have that they don't know how to face. One example is, how do I build resilience in my sales team? And we don't have the tools to be able to have an open, honest conversation. And that's one thing they're hoping that we could support with. So there's a lot we could do here, which is really exciting. And I can't wait to see how bringing that people organizations here helping them perform better as an organization but also having that tangential influence of nature around them will have going forward on on their approach yeah what's not to like come and have an amazing away day come and help support nature recovery help us do the education which we'll go on to talk more about and why that feels so close to our hearts and all of this is important for your environmental and social governance responsibilities so if you're interested then give us a shout and we'll send across our corporate brochure and we can chat further exciting So another area is ecopreneurship. We want to bring businesses to benefit from being part of this rerunning project and work together to create sustainability at the core of those organizations, but also ensuring that they continue to be profitable. A great example of that is the distillery. We've just got private permission put in and we're waiting for the response on that to have it open here. But it's going to be great to be able to generate non-alcoholic and alcoholic beverages here using the solar panels on our roof forest botanicals from the area the well, the spring water here and exploring ways in which we transport that liquid that isn't in glass bottles that take a lot of energy to produce so there's loads of cool stuff and eventually what would be nice to have is an ecosystem where everyone helps everybody else on the project by cross-selling sharing marketing expertise and knowledge so that's uh, really cool and 
And our final, hopefully, source of income is perhaps most relevant to our listeners, which is getting the opportunity to come and stay at the Granger Project in one of our tiny homes. So these are fantastic little spaces that have been made using sustainable principles at their heart. So using reclaimed doors and windows, reclaimed insulation. They're off grid with an amazing solar battery to charge your lights and and for your phone if needed. And we've really tried to invest in local businesses as much as we can in terms of the crockery, the blankets, the furniture in the space are all all have those principles at their heart. Yeah, and just to elaborate, you know, the solar panels and the batteries as well were all secondhand as well. So everything we could possibly do to make it as sustainable as possible, they're placed in the most remote but also beautiful places on the project to give you something really nice to wake up to or in the evening have your little sundown or drink and enjoy. And not only that, you have access to the Wilder Lodge whenever you want, where you can go and relax in comfy chairs, maybe cook yourself a meal, help yourself to the honesty bar, or read a book from our extensive library there and just really relax and, and engage with whoever's there if you want to. And the other maybe unique selling point of these tiny homes is the fact that you'll have the opportunity or the invitation to get involved in any of the rewilding, whether it's just doing a pollinator survey for us or digging a bit of a scrape. And the great thing is, is because it's all part of the community interest company, by choosing to come and stay with us, you're also helping us to maximise the impact for the education and the physical changes that we're hoping to achieve on the Grage Project. Yeah, we we don't want to turn and burn. We don't want to have just basically people coming in and out of these cabins all the time and trying to, we want people who actually are engaged in the project to come and, and enjoy it and relax as well. But you don't have to roll your sleeves up and get stuck in. If you are interested in these cabins, then the best place to go is to our newsletter to sign up for it. We will be letting you, anyone know that's part of the newsletter when you can start looking to sign up for these cabins and, and plan your stays. I can guarantee you there's no spam. In fact, we're the anti-spam newsletter. We, we are running out of time. We, don't, we haven't put one out for... It's my responsibility and it's always the last thing on my list, but I need to make it more of a priority. So you won't get spammed, but it's definitely, we will be emailing when the cabins are up for rental, etc. So you can sign up to that via our website. The link will be in the show notes. And the link will be in the show notes. <laughs> Sorry, Look, if you come this far, you're almost there. So hang in there. We're moving on to, ironically, probably the most important element to this conversation, but it's all, we've had the foundation and now this is where the, hopefully the output of the, all the previous 50 odd minutes worth of hard work have, have gone in. This feels like a big subject to cover in the last five minutes of this episode, but I'm going to give it a go. Essentially, my professional career has been working with children and young people. And during that journey, I observed that we were getting into a place in society where it felt like more and more young people were coming forward presenting with distress. And our solution to that distress was to give the young person a label and to offer them an individual intervention, whether that be therapy or medication. As we were getting to the point where we're now looking at one in five young people being diagnosed with these mental health conditions, I really started to become curious about what are we talking about here? Are we talking about problems with young people? Are we talking about problems at the level of our society and our community? And the more I learned about the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, the more I felt this is reflective of the fact that if we can't look after nature, we can't look after our home, our planet, then how do we look after each other and ourselves and our own well-being? So that's part of the context which has led us here to think about how do we help young people improve their well-being at a societal level? And indeed, all of us improve that well-being because it's not just the young people that are suffering. And what we've landed on is this idea of nature and the power of nature, not just the ecological services it provides by keeping our water healthy and helping us prevent flooding and, and growing our food. It's the regulatory benefits of spending time in nature, that impact it has on us emotionally, how it improves our creativity, our attention, our problem solving. All of that is enhanced by time in nature. So we want to bring young people and anyone really, including our corporates and those guests that come and stay in the tiny homes, to the site here. And we want them to come away with this amazing, immersive experience of time in wilder nature. And part of that involves education about nature, about ecosystems, about land use, about biodiversity loss and about the things that we can do in a really practical sense in terms of returning and restoring those ecosystems whilst also experiencing all of those implicit and explicit at times benefits of being in nature. The term that's come out of our podcast so far is nature literacy. We are lacking in nature literacy and that's including you and I Chloe, that's including our children, you know, we've got to hit that as early on as possible because you know, we're speaking to ecologists and the, the joy that they have when they go for walks is because they understand it. And we are now starting, you and I, Chloe, are starting to enjoy those walks because we're building our nature literacy and it becomes a joy to go out and seeing all these things happening. And we've got to start with understanding. Once you understand, then you can enjoy, then you can protect. 
yeah, and then you can connect. Yeah. And nature connection is a really important part of what we're trying to do here because we know through nature connection you get all of those myriad of benefits. And ultimately, if you connect and care about nature, you're going to do more to protect it, which is what we all need to address the meta crisis that we find ourselves in. Awesome. Happy to move on. I know that's a big area, but should we move on? I think so. I think there's a whole another podcast coming out about nature connection and the impact of that later on. Good. Okay. Just to finish off future plans, we're going to talk very high level on these ones just to give you a flavor of what's going to happen. Of course, hopefully, if we get planning, thing to look forward to is a distillery launch. Again, sign up for the newsletter. You won't miss out. Young Wilders are going to start doing their interventions and running the events here. Links in the show notes to them. If you want to get involved or you have friends or people you might know that might want to get involved, please feel free to forward on those links. We have a revamp to the website that's happening as we speak. It's going to be ongoing over the next few weeks to get it up to you know the next level, I suppose. Hopefully make it easier to find the key information you might be looking for. Orchard going. On the subject for grants, we've applied for a grant to put in a heritage orchard some with some really traditional Monmouthshire varieties surrounded by some beautiful wildlife-friendly hedging that our community to get can come and access and in the long term be able to harvest and make juices. Um, so, you know, hopefully that might be successful. We have also are looking still for opportunities to take our education programme to the next step by doing a bit of research and a bit of a feasibility study around what do schools, young people need from an outreach programme and we will continue to look for options of funding for that or indeed maybe just get on and do it. Um, and the other thing is kind of our stretch goal really is we would love to have a source of really wonderful local sustainable food production on the site here we listened to the episode with Duncan of Our Food 1200 and we were really inspired by how we can make sure that this rewilding project is also producing food for us so if anyone is interested in a market garden or becoming involved as a partner with us on that then please do reach out link in the show notes will be for Duncan's episode as well and finally, the final call is for our community day. So the 19th of October, it's our third community day. If you've got to the end of this podcast, I mean, hopefully you're inspired enough to maybe come and have a look at the project. We would like to would like to see you, new or old, if you've been here before, please just get yourself signed up and get yourself down for the project. There'll be, I guarantee you, delicious baking, warm welcome, and you get to do something really, really helpful, wholesome. Absolutely. Just think you can have a role in planting your own tiny forest and every year for the next X many years, you can come back and see its progress. That really nicely wraps up a base a year of rewilding on the Grange project. How really exciting. If you're sitting here and you are slightly inspired by what's happening here, the one way you can support is just by giving us a review and a rate on Spotify, on Apple, wherever it is. So please do it. It makes a huge difference and it's a very it'll take you over five minutes and I'll make a tangible difference to the reach that this podcast achieves. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone who's got this far. Bye.